So uh, I'll pass this over uh, to Marlene. Um, I'll let her introduce herself. Uh, we want to thank her for her um, for her presentation and for her time and for sharing some of her knowledge on this topic. So Marlene, uh, I will pass it over to you. Thanks so much, Dan. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to have so many people uh, on the line. So my name is Marlene Van Ness. Um, I probably know some of you. Uh, I'm the principal attorney and owner of Trellis Legal. Um, it's a law practice, transactional law practice, practice that specializes in food and ag businesses. Um, so I do everything from entity formation to uh, farm leasing to contracts. Um, to um, kind of negotiating other uh, sales agreements, to working on agritainment issues and land use. Um, it's basically anything that involves documentation um, and not litigation. Uh, that's what I do. And my background is in agriculture um, and crop production. And uh, so it's always great to see how I can support um, farmers in helping them tackle some of these legal issues that come up so they can do what they do best. Um, so this, the focus of this presentation today is, um, as many of you probably know, there's a real growth in um, kind of agritourism, agritainment activities in Pennsylvania and across uh, the U.S. Which, um, and so what we're going to do today is kind of what are some of those legal considerations if you want to have some events on your farm that you need to be thinking about so that you're not putting your farm at risk of any additional legal liability. Um, So just kind of the background is, what is agritourism and agritainment? I mean, they're very kind of interchangeable words, um, but basically it's any time you kind of are inviting members of the public and having them pay to come onto your property. Um, so some examples are farm stays, uh, harvest participation in workshops, farm dinners, so I know farm to table dinners are a really growing concept, hay rides, corn pits, corn mazes, weddings and events, um, farm stores. So when I'm talking about farm stores, I'm more talking about a farm store that's um, beyond um, uh, beyond just like a produce stand at, at, that you're having on your farm. So a, kind of a larger store with other items in it. A you pick operation, petting zoo, horse drives, and farm tours. So basically any, like I said, any time that you're having people pay to come onto your property. Um, so the very basic uh, kind of legal issue is business invitee liability. So in Pennsylvania, there's um, a, a different standards for what type of people are coming onto your property. And the highest standard, like the duty that you owe them and the, the protections you have to give them and your risk. So business invitee liability, which again is when you have people pay to come onto your property, is the highest standard. Um, so you have a duty to warn them and take reasonable care to protect them from dangerous conditions that you could have reasonable knowledge of. So what that really means, and we'll get into some of that for the individual topics, but what that really means is that if you know that there could be dangerous conditions, and I'm sure as many of you know, farms inherently um, have some of that, that, um, that there is... Um, the issue of making sure that people are aware of those and making sure you're keeping them generally safe. Now, you don't have to go above and beyond, as many people know. Um, the public can sometimes not be the smartest, especially when on farms, because uh, a lot of the public isn't always familiar with them. Um, so it's not, you know, you don't have to warn them of every possible thing, but anything that you know could be a reasonable, condi dangerous condition, you have to warn them about. We'll get in how to do that in a minute. Some additional considerations when you're thinking about agritainment is Clean and Green um, in 2004 was updated to allow for agritainment activities on agricultural use and forest uh, reserve and rolled land without uh, jeopardizing um, the uh, preferential tax treatment. So that's something good to know if you are enrolled in Clean and Green. Um, another point is um, there's no case law out, right, out there right now, and in discussions with the Department of Ag, they haven't taken the stance that there's protection for agritainment activities for farmers in terms of right to farm an acre. So there are potential, and I'll talk about them as we go through these, potential zoning issues where right to farm an acre might not protect you against having agritainment activities like it would um, by having a farm stand, et cetera. Um, and agricultural labor exemptions do not apply for agritainment work at this time. So if you're having farm workers 
work um, a corn maze or giving hay rides, that would make them not fall under the exemption for the week that they're working that. So now I'm just kind of going to go through the different types of agritainment activities and your different legal considerations for each of those. So farm tours, um, these are great. Um, it's a way to get people on your farm, especially a way to engage customers, get them to learn about your practices, who you are as a farmer, what your ideals are in terms of your agricultural approach. So farm tours um, are great. And I know some farms have people where they can stay and camp for a certain amount of time, or you just take people around. Um, but anytime you're charging for these types of farm tours, um, you are basically doing agritainment. Um, so one of the things, some of the legal considerations I say for farms to think about that do farm tours are have a standard operating procedure for the farm, you know, for your farm about how you prepare for having a farm tour. So this goes into how do you warn people against those um, dangerous conditions you might know about. So usually what I say for farmers, make sure you do a tour, I mean you're out there every day, but making sure you're doing a tour of checking out what um, dangers there might be when, you know, doing a sample run of your farm tour that you plan to do and making sure there's nothing you need to warn people about if there's a ditch or depending on if you're walking or riding or kind of that situation. Also have some signage. So again, depending on the scope of what your operation is doing, it's good sometimes to have some signage as to what areas you don't want people going. So having some signs saying, you know, please down the tour or please do not enter this area. So you make sure it's clear what people, you know, do not touch farm equipment. Um, just kind of some signage to give them inherent uh, warnings of some of those inherent conditions. Um, sometimes, again, depending on the scope, um, we draft kind of a waiver and expectation sheet. So sometimes what I have, for one farm I worked with, we basically put together a document that they send out to people ahead of time to let them know what to expect. Sometimes it's as simple as um, wear appropriate shoes if you're going on a farm. Um, you'd be surprised the number of people who will show up in uh, flip-flops. Um, and so it's important to make sure that you understand that. Um, I also saw just quickly in the message, I saw the question of what if you're not charging? So it is a different duty. So you still have some duty to um, people you aren't charging in terms of warning them, but the standard isn't as high. Um, so it's good to put these things in practice just in case, but your liability isn't quite as much at risk. Um, so again, having, and if you're not charging, there's not really, you can't really use a, a waiver, which I'll get into in a minute, because there's no consideration. There's no exchange of money for them signing the waiver. So again, it's best, you know, a lot of these things are for when you're charging for these activities. Um, so the waiver is, in addition to the term sheet, which I said, again, is like warning people about the appropriate tire to wear on a farm, things to expect on a farm. Um, but then the waiver is kind of basically a legal document saying, I understand I'm entering onto a working farm and there are risks with me walking on this farm and I accept these risks. Um, there's, you know, you can do some of your own research to find out what's out there. Um, you can also work with an attorney, like I've done this for other farms where we draft um, this waiver. And one of the things is, I mean, you can make it pretty simple. Like the ones I've drafted have usually been a page to three quarters of a page that just give people expectations and then have the waiver at the bottom and you just have everyone on the tour sign it either ahead of time or, or um, on the farm. Again, the expectation sheet is nice to send out ahead of time so you make sure people are showing up in proper clothing and with the right expectations. Um, and then last is kind of animal considerations. If you are do have a farm that is, um, has livestock, what are, you, what are you going to allow people to do? You know, a lot of times I recommend just saying you don't touch the livestock. Um, if you allow people to pet livestock, then we'll talk about that a little more when we get into the petting zoo. But having a, at least having a, a standard procedure for how you're going to handle people interacting with any livestock on your property. So next are farm stores. Um, and again, um, I'm talking a little bit more here about um, a, a more comprehensive farm stand than just um, you put a produce stand out where you only sell your products. As you kind of see under the zoning and permitting issue, right to farm very clearly protects um, farm stands that are just selling on farm produce um, or meats. Um, 
basically anything produced directly on the farm in a whole or processed form. It's when you start having a farm stand that kind of includes other items that is a walk-in building, not just a stand on the side of the road, um, that, that you get into some of these other uh, considerations. The first being separation of liability. So I know this is kind of, there's some farms that have these big farm stands that you can go into. They're separate, um, they're even sometimes located in a separate location from the main farm where production occurs. Um, and so sometimes it's a good idea to separate the liability of your farm from that farm stand. And the way you do that is set up a separate entity. So where you might have XYZ Farm LLC for your operation, you might have XYZ Farm Store LLC for your um, farm store so that if anything happens in that store, anyone gets sick from the products, anything like that, your farm operation and their assets are not at risk. Um, food production and storage requirements, so making sure you understand um, if you are using any processed products or um, process including um, once your meat has been processed and stored. Um, are you meeting the refrigeration requirements? Are you pr producing all the food that you're selling in um, any ready to eat food? Are you meeting the commercial kitchen or limited commercial kitchen requirements of the state or the county depending on where you are? Um, so that can be important if you're doing any sort of food processing. Um, and again, the storage, so making sure that your, you know, your, your refrigerators, if you're holding meats or any other perishable items, are at the right temperature um, because you will be sub could be subject to inspection. Um, and other things like labeling as well, so eggs are required to be labeled, um, milk is required to be labeled, so making, those are the only two that have to have, like, Eggs have to have when they were harvested, and um, milk has to have a general sell-by date or use-by date. Um, so, and you can look up those requirements and talk to me or another lawyer about those. Um, and making sure you're meeting all the kind of labeling and food requirements. From a zoning and permitting standpoint, um, again, if you have a separate enclosed structure, you have to make sure that you have an occupancy permit and meet all the building permit requirements for a commercial building uh, for that. And for zoning, it's important to understand whether or not that type of um, business would be allowed in your, um, in your zoning district. And there's a lot of discussion right now over what really is part of an agriculture operation or not. I'm actually involved in the zoning case right now relating to that. So it's important to get an understanding of what's permitted, what's considered part of your, what's protected under right to farm, what's allowed, um, and depending on your um, borough or township, sometimes it's good to have a discussion with them um, to get to know ahead of time, um, but it's definitely a consideration that's coming up more and more. Farm stores, not quite as much, but um, having like little classes in your farm store, demonstrations, stuff like that can start to get, um, get into some land use issues if those kind of things aren't explicitly permitted. I know it sounds silly because it's all part of agriculture and we all know that, um, but sometimes uh, boroughs and townships don't know that. Um, but again, be aware that Right to Farm does protect that at least, if at least 50% of the agricultural products are coming directly from your farm and constitute um, whole or processed ag products, then you're safe. Um, there are some Right to Farm cases that deal with the separation where if you're selling a lot of non-agricultural products, like there's a case that deals with if you're selling canning jars and all those things where you start to get outside the scope of right to farm. So sometimes it's good to talk to a lawyer or the township to get a sense of what's allowed. So farm stays and farm dinners, um, these are a great way to get people to engage with your farm, um, to get an understanding of what your farm is, potential, bring in potential customers, um, and get to eat and use some of the products you grow uh, or make on your farm. Um, so some legal considerations for there. Again, uh, separation of liability more deals if you're doing overnight stays. So if you convert a building or build a building on your property that you're going to have people stay in, um, separating that liability from your farm operation by potentially putting it under, you know, you have XYZ Farm LLC, and then you have XYZ Farm Stays LLC. So potentially separating that liability. And again, it really depends on the specific situation. You know, what the scope of Farm Stays you're doing. Is it a separate building? You know, how much money is it bringing in? And all those factors kind of go in as to when is the right time to separate that liability 
So sometimes it's good to talk to a lawyer about that and see when, when the right time might be. You know, sometimes if you're just doing an Airbnb in your house, the risk isn't that high and Airbnb provides good insurance. Um, or at least some insurance. I actually don't know how good it is. Um, or making sure, um, and I, get, I have a separate slide on insurance, but that is something to think about is when you're doing anything that's not part of your ag operation, um, I, I know you would argue a lot of these things are part of your ag operation, but I mean by ag operation, I mean production. Um, it's important to make sure that you are talking to your insurance agent because traditional farm insurance does not cover most of these activities. Um, so again, specifically for overnight stays and farm to table dinners, food production regulations. If you're having a chef come to your farm and prepare the food, you need to make sure you have a commercial kitchen that meets all the requirements for them to prepare that food on site. If not, you can have them prepare it off site and bring it and serve it, um, but you do have to meet um, commercial kitchen requirements if you're preparing any food on site. Whether And those requirements, like I said, um, are either set by the state or if you're in Allegheny, Erie, or the counties surrounding um, Harrisburg, Philadelphia, and there's two more counties that they have their own separate um, de uh, delegated authority to oversee. So like in Allegheny County, we have some stricter regulations regarding commercial kitchens than those counties that fall under the state jurisdiction have. So it's important to make sure you understand those before you have a farm-to-table dinner or if you cook food in the morning for someone staying at your farm, you're supposed to meet those requirements if they're paying to come to your, um, to your farm for either of these activities. Again, zoning and permitting. Um, I can't harp on this enough. You know, a lot of places are really lenient and it's great, um, but then you also end, how, uh, end up in eight month long dragged out um, zoning cases over whether or not this is part of agriculture and or if it's um, not permitted. So it's important to get an understanding of what activities are allowed in your zoning district um, and whether or not, and kind of how strict your zoning district is about these things. And one of the biggest things, honestly, is who are your neighbors? Because nine times out of 10, when there's a zoning issue, it's because the neighbors are complaining. So I know like there's a, one farmer who presented um, at, when we did the workshop at Frankfurt who said, you know, she goes over and gives fresh eggs to her neighbors um, regularly and tells them when she's going to have events and so they know ahead of time and has a really great relationship with her neighbors so she hasn't had any issues. But then there's other situations where the neighbors complain and then they can turn into a whole problem. So making sure you talk to your neighbors about what you're planning to do and um, invite them or have a relationship with them that you feel that it's not going to cause an issue for either of you. Another important consideration is alcohol liability. Again, this kind of goes to that your traditional farm insurance doesn't cover these activities. So if you're going to have alcohol on your property um, and serve it to people, either in exchange for their attendance at the dinner or um, in general, so um, it's important to, to decide who's going to handle alcohol liability. So sometimes the restaurant or chef that's um, partnering with you to have a farm to table dinner has alcohol liability and they can use it for this event. Sometimes if um, you're partnering with someone or uh, having a wedding or something like that, you can get day of insurance. Either you can get it or you can ask your um, the people who are renting it or you're partnering with to get that insurance. Um, but it's definitely something to think about because a lot of stupid things happen when alcohol is involved. <laughs> um, and finally, signage. So again, you know, if you're going to have a bunch of people milling around your farm, it's sometimes good to have signage that um, shows what areas are restricted or where they shouldn't go or have very clear signage of where they should go so that it's clear where they're supposed to be limiting their um, movement. Marlene, there were two questions that came up there. Um, what about the instance of uh, BYO uh, in terms of alcohol? and then uh, would suggested donations be considered uh, charging? So suggested donation is kind of this um, kind of this gray area. So the issue with suggested donation is it gets away from like specifically charging for alcohol, which and that's the thing too, if you're providing alcohol and specifically charging for it, you need a liquor license for that. If you're basically providing alcohol for free and there's a suggested tip or donation, 
that makes it a little more um, outside the, the, the general requirement that you have to have a permit or that the person, people serving alcohol have to have permits. Generally, one thing I always say, though, and um, we're having to do this for my wedding this fall, is um, make if you have someone catering or you're partnering with a chef, have someone who is um, a trained bartender or licensed to serve serving it because that also helps the insurance be lower because even if you're not um, having people pay for alcohol or, or just having a suggested donation, it's kind of a good idea to have alcohol liability and so a lot of times they'll ask you who is serving it and it can affect your rate whether people are just allowed to serve themselves you're serving it or you have someone who's a licensed bartender or someone with the gone through the bartender training to serve that. Um, so that's definitely a consideration, something to talk about with your insurance company. BYO is a little more open because um, you're basically not taking on any liability. You're not serving. So that's an important thing too though. If you, if you do BYO, you can't serve any of that alcohol. You can open the bottle and that's it. Um, because I, I once had a discussion with a, one of my clients who's in catering and he was like, oh, well, I'll have them bring their own alcohol and then I'll mix them drinks. You can't do that because then you're part of serving the alcohol and mixing the alcohol. So if it's BYO, that definitely doesn't require the liquor permit. But um, I would still talk to your insurance agent as to what they recommend in terms of insurance. And then also thinking about, um, you know, again, making sure you're not involved in any of the serving of alcohol. And it's still a good idea, even though you're not liable for people's actions when it's BYO as much, they're happening on your property and there still could be some risk with that. And so it's good to make sure you're kind of keeping an eye on things or maybe put a limit on what people can bring. Um, a lot of times it's up to you with the risk you're comfortable with, the people you're inviting, the size of the event, something like that. But again, the strictest requirements are when um, you're charging specifically um, for food and alcohol in, in the combined price or you are, and like I said, it, unless you have a liquor license, you can't charge directly for alcohol. So like if you say it's a dinner and then you'll serve alcohol for, you know, you know $2 a pour or something like that, it's still directly charging for the alcohol and that's where you can get in trouble. Um, so suggested donation, like I said, is kind of in that gray area. It just depends on kind of what it's directly relating to and if you can kind of remove that it's, that it's required in any way or it could be inferred that it's required, then you kind of are able to get yourself out of some of those requirements. Um, so harvest participation and workshops, so um, actually one of my really good friends is a cranberry farmer up in Massachusetts and he has a lot of people come to his farm for harvest participation. Um, so one note about this, uh, this webinar is specifically about Pennsylvania law because I'm a licensed Pennsylvania attorney. Um, so that's one thing to know if you are joining in from a state that's not Pennsylvania. A lot of these same considerations apply but it's important to talk to a lawyer um, or someone who would be knowledgeable on these subjects in your state to make sure that there's not any differences. Um, but so just as an example, um, my friend who's a cranberry farmer often has people come and help with the cranberry harvest. Um, so it's just a way to um, have them involved. Again, not having them pay definitely reduces the amount of liability you could take on, um, which is good. But, you know, the thing is, is like, just because you don't have, you have lower liability or they don't have a case doesn't mean people can't sue you and still cost you money. So it's important to still take some of these precautions because, you know, there's no bar to people suing you. They can always sue you. So, you know, a lot of this comes from, as I've talked about, relationships with people and, um, you know, signage and just do, because a lot of times if they think you made reasonable efforts, they're less likely to sue you. So it's kind of part of that. Um, good faith relationship starting out. So again, this applies to if you're charging for harvest participation in workshops, or I know like my friend's farm charges like $15 to come watch the harvest. As soon as you're charging money, um, and I would argue here in a, if it's a suggested donation, people pay it, or it's strongly suggested and expected, that they could argue that liability is also applied. Um, it just really depends on the unique situation. So opportunities for guests to participate um, and help with harvest or learning agricultural practices and techniques. Um, this is different than having like 4-H or FFA on your farm because they typically have a separate relationship in their own insurance. But, you know, general public is just what a lot of these um, activities are talking about. 
So having safety precautions, going over that with them either when they get on the farm or having them sign something. As a lawyer, I'm going to tell you it's always good to have something in writing. But if you have something, you know, if you have a standard operating procedure where you go through um, the, uh, the procedures and expectations at the beginning when people arrive, that also works. Um, so going over with people the safety precautions they should take, where they should stay, where they shouldn't go, et cetera. What, what, you know, if they need to have any accommodations for the work that they're doing. Sometimes it's good to have a liability waiver if they're really actively participating heavily. Um, so having something for them to sign that, that waives that they understand what activities they're participating in and that there might be manual labor and that, you know, they, it's their duty to be cautious of any um, injuries that they have and not, um, you know, those kind of things. And again, it's something that could be customized to you um, based on what you're going to have them do. And again, just going over the expectations. I can't stress enough how just having a clear conversation with people or e when if you're emailing with anybody and just telling them what to expect goes a long way in sort of getting that relationship going so they're less likely to be litigious and mad if something happens. So hay rides, um, so this is, I'm talking about either horse or tractor drawn with hay seats. Again, this would be if you're paying for it or it's part of um, paying to um, participate in these activities, so like an entrance fee or so. So some legal considerations here are the Pennsylvania amusement law. So it, Pennsylvania has an amusement law that applies to uh, ac activities where you're riding uh, around in, in some sort of activity or, or in some sort of vehicle or wagon or something like that. There is an exemption for agricultural tours. Um, so it's just important that if that's not the purpose of your horse or tractor ride, so for example, if you do like a haunted um, hay ride that it's really meant to just show off um, the, the spooky things that you create and it's all about the haunted experience, that might fall under the PA amusement law. And it's not, it's not ridiculous to comply with, but you have to register um, uh, with the state and comply with the different components. A lot of farmers don't fall under this, but it's important to be aware of and maybe talk to a lawyer or the state, or, and I know Penn State does some advising on this as to whether or not your activity. But if you're doing tours of your farm or tours to the field or something like that, then you, you know, it falls under that exemption. Again, rules and signage, a lot of times I, the farms I've worked with on these things, I recommend get it, having a sign where people get onto the ride that says, you know, keep all hands and feet inside at all times, do not get off the ride while it's moving, um, you know, please be cautious and brace yourself when if necessary, just some basic things, you know, you can always make them approachable too. So a lot of times when I'm writing them for people, we talk about saying like, keep all hands and feet, you know, be careful, hold your child's hand, and have fun. You know, you, there's ways you can make these signs um, less aggressive or, or less off-putting and just have them be a way to be like, oh, that's a really good point. Um, I've talked to clients where they've had people jump off the back while they're crossing a highway um, to, to get a shirt they dropped or something like that, and then you can get in some really dicey situations. So if you go over there, you know, have those signs and rules ahead of time. Um, having an incident procedure in place. This goes a long way for if you do get sued. If you had like a process for what happens if someone gets hurt and you follow that process, um, it can really be helpful. And usually what I say um, to include in that process is at the time, at, you know, as you're helping someone who might have gotten injured, you know, write down exactly what happened. Have you or your employee or, you know, seasonal worker write down um, what happened so it's fresh in the minds at that time. And sometimes if you can even get the person who was injured after, you know, you've dealt, helped them medically um, to write down what happened and sign it, that's really helpful so that if they ever come back and sue you and try to say something else happened, be like, look, no, we have this document. You can say to the court, we have a clear incident procedure. We have the signage, and you're much more likely to be protected. Um, I was Googling one day about hay rides and I actually found there's a lawyer somewhere in Eastern PA who like makes a living off suing people who get injured on hay rides. Um, I'm not kidding. And so it is, it sounds like it doesn't happen that often, but there are people out there. Um, 
I promise we're, there's some good, good lawyers out there, um, but, but there's also these guides. So it's something to be cautious about um, and make sure just having as many kind of procedures and uh, ahead of time notice and signage can really help prevent some of those situations. Um, if you're using uh, horses um, for your wagon ride, um, there is the equine limited liability law in Pennsylvania, which basically says that you cannot be sued for the inherent dangers of participating in a horse-related um, activity as long as you have certain signage. And the signage has to say that you assume the risk of equine activities pursuant to Pennsylvania law. And there's a couple of sites you can just even order those through. Um, so if you are having any activities that involve horses, you should put that sign up so you get to take advantage of that limited liability law. So petting zoos and horse rides, meaning like riding directly on horses. Um, so operating procedures. Again, this anytime you have a little bigger operation where agritainment is a major component of your farm and your farm income, um, which I think that's starting to grow in Pennsylvania, it's good to have operating procedures because especially if it's not just you or you and the other owners of your farm, you're starting to hire some people to help you with these activities. It's good to have a standard operating procedure that people – um, that all your employees, contractors, owners, et cetera, are aware of and follow. Again, that goes to that whole, if you get sued, you can easily say, look, we have operating procedures to take measures to prevent these types of situations. Um, so just having, you know, how to prepare, um, you know, doing a tour of the areas where people are going to be to make sure there's no inherent dangers, making sure um, everything's set up, checking on uh, the behavior of the animals that day, things like that. And just having a checklist is always helpful, especially for petting zoos and um, horse rides, having rules and signage. So don't bring in any outside food or drink anywhere near the pens. How to pet um, animals, kind of, you know, giving them advice because a lot of people haven't interacted with some of these livestock before. Um, having signage regarding the risks, so understand that animals may bite and be careful. Um, and then having like sanitizing stations, so advising people to wash their hands um, or use sanitizing stations after petting farm animals. Um, so again, to help spread any, it's help prevent it, the spread of any um, diseases or issues like that. And again, having that incident procedure. Um, so if something does happen, someone does get bitten, you have a procedure on how to deal with those situations so you're not just running around wondering what to do. Or you have some employee running up to you and be like, some kid just got bit, what do I do? So to have those in place and train um, people working on your farm and working these events. Um, and again, if you have horses involved, uh, posting that equine li limited liability sign. You pick operations. These fall under a little more traditional ag work, but so where people can pay uh, to either come in or they pay in purchasing the crop and participating in the um, you pick. Um, for the direct purchase and consumption. So again, this is just, this one's a little more straightforward, but having something where you have rules and signage, so just making it clear what areas people are supposed to be in, um, if you have any rules about where they step or what to look out for, um, that's a good idea. Like I said, a lot of it isn't even just like telling people where they can't go, but just making it clear where they can go. Um, Pennsylvania also has limited liability for UPIC operations. So that means that as long as you comply with the business invitee obligations, which again, warning anybody of inherent dangers that you have, would have the ability to know about, um, then you should, um, as long as you have any signage and you warn them and you take reasonable precautions, you make it clear what areas are supposed to be in, then you um, can't be sued uh, for negligence. Um, under this UPIC limited liability. Now what's important to understand too is that if you have UPIC and then you also have other activities, the UPIC limited liability only applies to the UPIC part of your operation. Weddings and events. Um, so these are something that basically takes us to the next level of a farm dinner. Um, so if you typically have, you know, farm dinners are usually a little smaller, they're shorter, um, but weddings, you know, you have probably more alcohol, louder music, et cetera. Um, the biggest thing I would say to worry about is definitely zoning and permitting. These tend to piss off the neighbors the most. So at least just being aware of what your zoning allows. Um, and if you need a permit for any component of it, um, again, food preparation requirements. If you're serving any food on site, do you have a certified commercial kitchen that meets all the requirements? 
Um, yeah, the nuisance again is going to the the neighbor potential neighbor complaints. Alcohol and alcohol liability. Um, so again, making it clear what your standard is for um, serving alcohol at weddings and events. Are you providing it? Who's actually serving the alcohol? Um, who's required to carry the alcohol liability insurance? So for example, for my wedding in October, I'm required to get, um, like we're just serving wine that we're bringing in, um, and we're going to have one of our caterers serve it, and, but we're required to get the alcohol limited liability insurance. Um, again, good signage, showing people where to go, where not to go, because especially when people are drunk, they're going to start to wander. Um, you want to help avoid that as much as possible. Um, and then especially if you're using, if you're not hosting them yourself, or you're hosting them but also allowing someone else to kind of rent the area, it's important to have a contract. So then you can, you know, limit your liability, have them accept a lot of liability. That's where you can make it clear who's responsible for the insurance requirements, what you're charging, what's included, and what you're doing. So I am, um, you know, one of the farms I work with, they would provide um, all the flowers and, dec and some of the decorations utilizing on-farm products. Um, but then the um, the people who would you know have the weddings would be um, responsible for providing the food and alcohol, any additional decorations, et cetera. Um, so this is probably that one. Um, I won't go back, but Marlene, no weddings and events are probably the biggest troublemakers. So just make sure an event kind of includes all day festivals and all like that. That's the biggest one to be cautious of your neighbor, to talk to them, to be aware of what your zoning restrictions are, and to be really cautious about your liability. So making sure it's very clear who's responsible for what insurance um, and who's responsible for what happens during that event. Um, so just kind of an overall about insurance is, again, your, your traditional ag operation insurance is not going to cover these activities. So it's important to talk to your insurance agent about what agritainment or agritourism activities you're going to have on your farm to see what additional coverage you may need. Um, we talked about liquor liability, so again, what, um, what you might be required to have um, or, you, or you, what you require of people coming onto your property um, if alcohol is involved. Um, again, if you aren't having regular activities, um, so you aren't, agritainment isn't a regular part, but you have one or two farm to table dinners, you can always purchase day of event insurance for that single day that covers your activities. So that's something good to look into. If you're not having events all the time, or you're just dipping your toe into agritourism, um, to, you can get day of event insurance for pretty cheap. Um, I just purchased it for my wedding, and it was about 100 bucks, so it's not too bad. Um, the other thing is vendors. So I know I worked with a farm who has, um, in the fall and the weekends, he allows other vendors to come up and set up tables in this little other area, vendor area, so people coming to the farm festival on, on their farm can also kind of purchase from local vendors, taste from local wineries, etc. So one thing to think about with that is who's responsible for what in that situation? Are you requiring your vendors to have their own insurance? Are you asking them to provide you a copy of it? Are you being named as an additionally insured? Or are you providing insurance, um, which could probably get a little expensive, especially if some of your vendors are going to be serving alcohol, because um, they're going to probably have to have their own alcohol insurance. A lot of vendors, depending on who they are, like some larger ones, especially wineries, breweries, et cetera, will have their own insurance um, for these types of things. But it's important to have those conversations. And I've even written you know, like a one-page terms and conditions sheet uh, for a farm to give to vendors that come on their farm. So it's clear on what the expectations are, um, what happens if you cancel last minute, if there was any cost associated with that, or what your relationship is, who's responsible for what, you know, if someone's serving food as a vendor and someone gets sick that you're not responsible for that. So laying out some of those specific terms. Um, and again, consider passing on that liability and insurance requirements to, uh, to clients and vendors when appropriate. So if you're having someone basically have an event on your property, you know, you might want to ask them to provide the, insurance, the general liability and liquor liability insurance. If you're hosting the event, it's usually on you to have it. Um, but again, like we just talked about with vendors, if they're coming onto your farm and, um, and, and serving things, then it's 
you know, you might want to have them have their own insurance. Um, and follow up on that too. You know, if you require them to have insurance, it's sometimes good to check because if something does happen and they are kind of a really small business that doesn't have the money to cover an incident, then it doesn't matter if you require them to cover it or not, they probably won't have the money and you'll be the one forking it over. Um, just a quick note though, I know a lot of this sounds scary, doom and gloom, but really, you know, the, these things don't happen that often. I'd say the zoning and local township issues are probably the biggest, but from a liability standpoint, it's really not that much and a lot of it's basic common sense stuff. Um, so don't be too intimidated by all these uh, legal recommendations. And again, it really depends on your specific farm, what you're doing and how, how in depth you wanna go with these. If you're inviting friends and family, you probably don't have to hit every single one. But if you're having like big farm or fall festivals, like that's something to think about these other components. I would say the biggest are definitely, you know, if you are having larger activities, having the separate insurance, because that can really go a long way in any of these um, scenarios. And then basic signage as much as you can. Um, and just even like the, the operating procedures and just having that everyone has to walk around and check you know, before the festival opens, then check to make sure there's not any uh, gopher holes or something that people could fall in or broken uh, wire or something that people could get injured on and just do those checks. And for most times people are there to have a good time and aren't looking to sue you, um, but you never know. So it's just important to kind of weigh those things. So again, some key, key takeaways here. Um, so from both a liability and business standpoint, plan. So think about whether or not you need to separate liability, whether or not you need to um, have a standard operating procedure, whether or not you need separate insurance, et cetera. Definitely be wary of zoning and permitting. Like I said, that's kind of one of the bigger issues right now where people are having challenges, um, especially you know if you're thinking about doing a farm stay, uh, a lot of times those things aren't clearly permitted in residential or farm districts. Um, Airbnb kind of gets sometimes around those, allows you to do it a little more under the radar, but again, um, there's, there's some cracking down on that and it still doesn't mean that you're not operating a business out of your house. Um, so it's important to understand that. And sometimes like if you know your zoning officer and have a good relationship with them, it doesn't hurt to have a conversation or consult a lawyer before you end up spending thousands of dollars defending this in front of the zoning board or even higher. So a lot of time, again, uh, zoning and being wary of zoning and permitting can even mean going and bringing uh, cookies to your neighbor. Um, so making sure you understand, um, working with a lawyer and accountant to understand both the liability and then also um, any accounting uh, impacts in terms of your Schedule F or your um, your exempt employees, uh, farm worker exempt employees, things like that. Um, you know, a lot of people, it's hard to balance when's the right time to do that when you're just thinking about starting this and you're like, do I really want to go spend money to talk to a lawyer and accountant when I might, I'm just thinking about having, giving some farm tours. But a lot of us do, as, you know, I know I do and I'm sure others do a free initial consultation just to talk you through some general considerations, what to think about. And a lot of times when I talk to clients, I say, okay, for this first one, here's your basic things you need to worry about. If you grow into X, Y, and Z, then this is when you might want to come back and think about these other considerations. So that might, might be the right time to form a new LLC if a certain part of your agritainment business is really taking off and, and, and incurring a lot of attention and potentially, separate li uh, and potentially liability, which then it might be good to separate it from your farm. So things like that, like I said, you know, it's, you don't have to go whole hog <laughs> right away, but having a conversation because at least can help you in that planning process. Create those response procedures. That's one of the big ones, you know, especially if you're doing anything that could result in an injury. Um, it's good to have that. Those, those can go a long way in terms of your defense if anything happens. Talk to your insurance agent and make friends with your neighbors. <laughs> um, so just a policy note about Ohio and Pennsylvania. So Ohio actually already has a limited liability law for agritourism, which provides the same type of protection as the UPIC and the equine law, which is a, it's great. I think states are starting to recognize um, the 
how much this is becoming a part of, of agriculture and the viability of small farms. Um, so what they basically say is similar to the equine law. In Ohio, you just have to have a sign on your farm, and I have it there. Um, you can look it up and or you talk to an Ohio lawyer that basically says that there's no liability for injury or death of a participant in agritourism activity conducted on his farm, um, et cetera. And, um, that you don't have legal duty to remove risks that are inherent to the agritourism. So again, if there's things like broken barbed wire or fencing or holes that people could fall in or injure themselves, you could easily prevent. But things like um, inherent agritourism activities, or if you're sitting on a on a tractor or you're sitting on um, a hay bale on a hay ride, there's certain things that could happen that are inherent to agritourism. Um, and so you can read more about that Ohio law too um, if you're located in Ohio. In Pennsylvania, unfortunately, we don't have this law yet, but it is um, currently up for its second consideration in the Pennsylvania Senate. Um, so I think Pennsylvania is starting to recognize the importance of this. Um, so it, it would protect farmers from civil liabilities for injuries to patrons that are inherent to the participation in agritourism and agritainment activities. Um, so that's great. You know, by being inherently on a farm for a festival, um, walking around, as long as the danger wasn't something that you could easily prevent, and it, it, it would be protected. Um, similar to the equine law, you just have to post a notice that there are risks of injury or participating. It's kind of a long posting um, that, that um, I didn't copy and paste all of it here, but it's very similar to Ohio's law. Like I said, unfortunately, it's not in, in effect yet, so that's why for outside of UPIC and equine activities, you still have to take those kind of some of those extra precautions. Um, but so some of my advice might change if this does go through in terms of all the steps you need to take. It never hurts to give people more notice. Again, like I talked about, one of the biggest considerations is just like, do you have a good relationship with people? If people saw that you warned them and they tripped, they're like, well, they did warn me. That can help reduce and, and kind of diffuse a situation where they might be like, I had no idea this could happen. You gave me no warning like, now I'm going to sue you because I'm pissed off. <laughs> so having that kind of good relationship with both your neighbors and your at attendees can really go a long way until some of these more stricter uh, limitations on liability go through. So that's actually it for me. I figured you guys would probably have some specific questions to your uh, farms and some of the activities you're thinking about doing, so I left a lot of time for that. Um, again, I will kind of answer some general questions. If you have really specific questions that will probably that might require me to have some more information, you can send me an email. My email address um, is right on the screen right now, Marlene at trellispgh.com. Um, I'm happy to kind of set up a free initial consultation with any of you to talk through any of these things, make what I call my legal to-do list, um, and, and prioritize them. So I'm happy to talk to anybody about those kind of things. So. Uh, other than that, I'll, I'll take some questions. So Marlene, there was a question here uh, about which statute in Pennsylvania protects UPIC operations. Ooh, good question. Um, I will find the citation for you real quick. Um, I didn't have it up there, but it's basically, um, the, it's the UPIC if you Google, and I'll try to find it right now. The, the exact citation, but it's uh, Pennsylvania UPIC limited liability law. Sure. Um, let me see if I can, I can find it here. Um, and I actually wrote a blog post. If you go onto my trellispgh.com website, I also write a lot of um, blog posts about certain these types of issues. Um, and I wrote one around Christmas uh, on UPEC. So let me see if I can find the citation real quick. Well, Marlene's looking for that. If you do have other questions um, that would be not so specific, but that you think would benefit everyone else, please feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, we'll read them out uh, here for it to get some responses. Um, and the citation is 42 uh, PA. CSA, Consolidated Statutes Annotated, Section 8339A. Um, so that's the citation. Again, if you uh, go on my blog and find this blog post titled How to Avoid the Naughty List for UPIC Operations, um, again, I wrote this around Christmas time, you can find it. I can actually put that link, I think, in the chat. Um, 
and this has the direct site in there as well. Um, I saw the, the question about legality in New Jersey. Unfortunately, I'm a Pennsylvania lawyer, so I can't advise on New Jersey law. Um, a lot of these things um, depend on your state, but uh, some of these things are kind of general, especially like the insurance considerations are is a general advice. Putting up signage is good general advice. Making friends with your neighbor. Um, the only thing I can't advise on in terms of le legality in New Jersey is if you have any limited liability laws or um, any special provisions that affect agritainment or business invitee liability. Again, whenever you're inviting people to your farm, it's called business invitee um, uh, uh, liability. Um, I see Tara's question, are there any requirements to have Porta John's bathrooms when hosting a day of event? Um, who takes the liability. So that depends um, what the Porta John company's contract says. If they take the liability or you're responsible for them, most of the times you're responsible for any damage that happens when you're renting them. That's kind of the general practice with most rental companies for anything, is that if any damage occurs while it's on your property that's not inherent to the product, you're typically liable for it. Porta John, so usually if you're having events open to the public, completely open to the public, you're usually re required to comply with ADA laws. Um, and uh, ATRA actually put a really good um, uh, workbook out or guidebook out about um, considerations for having these and other legal. Um, I'll see if I can pull that up and put that link in there too. Um, and then uh, and then generally also make sure you're aware of any, if your zoning requires any bathrooms or um, uh, or parking requirements. So sometimes local zoning ordinances will also have um, requirements of how you have to handle parking um, and situations like that. Um, I know like one I was just looking at deals largely with um, just that you have to mitigate erosion and have clear um, and, and have clear designated areas for parking, but um, other than that, uh, there's not. Uh, it just depends a lot on your zoning ordinance and what's required. Here's the um, link that you can click on to download the ATRA PDF that talks about entertainment, farming, and agritourism, and they have a good section on there about when you're required to have ADA requirements. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Um, we have lots of time. <laughs> But again, I'm happy to kind of answer them offline as well. I would encourage if you have a question that you think is sort of uh, on the bubble, still feel free to throw it out there because if you're dealing with it, I'm sure someone else is dealing with it as well. So, Potluck events, that's a good question. Um, it, the old favorite lawyer answer, it depends. So if you're charging people to come then the liability issues still apply. If you're not cooking any food on the premises and people are bringing their own food, then that's different. So um, you're not charging to um, for the serving of food or for the purchase of food, um, then, then you don't have the same commercial kitchen and food requirements because people are bringing the food. It's not a pay, you're not paying directly for the food. So you get um, around some of those requirements. Um, it, it also, like I said, depends if it's just kind of friendly, fa family and friends um, and private invite, then you're not going to deal with a lot of these same, then you're more considered under the guest provision on, of um, how liability is treated, which is a, a lower bar, um, as opposed to people paying to come onto your farm and, and it's open to the general public. Uh, so the question is, so if you have an event and just ask for donations, not a dinner or just a farm tour as such, is that considered charging and how would consider it as liability? So if you're just charging for a farm tour or donation, so that's why I said the donations is kind of the, the weird line because if, if it's basically a mandatory donation, someone could argue that that liability does apply. Um, if it's not a charge donation, then um, the same type of liability doesn't apply. Um, so that's something that, again, it's a lower bar um, that you're, you're dealing with.
So I can try to look up real quick what the guest liability is because they would probably fall under that. But the time you're inviting the public, um, you still have a little bit of um, risk there. And it really just depends on um, what the situation is and, you know, if it's implied, if it's a, considered basically a mandatory donation. I mean, it's still a good idea just in that situation because farm tours don't have the same type of, of high liability um, uh, or high risk that a lot of these other events do. Just going over people when they come, what the expectations are, um, and stuff like that can help mitigate a lot of that because there aren't as many inherent dangers. And again, sometimes I, that's where I just recommend making sure sending something out that says like, hey, wear the right shoes and you understand that you're coming onto a working farm and you might hear noises and see things. And, you know, that's just something um, uh, that those are general good considerations. Farm tours, like I said, are usually not as, um, as high of a risk as those kind of things. Um, I saw there was another question. Thoughts about events like far Farm City Days with different farmers and farm organizations offering public invitations. Um, can you provide some clarification on what Farm City Days are? Or like, so are you talking, is there basically an event where um, you're inviting lots of other farmers to just participate and vendors and, and things like that? Um, I'll just start answering it from that perspective. Um, but basically, if, they're, if you're having a lot of farmers and other farm organizations, again, one of the biggest issues is, OK, perfect. Um, one of the other considerations is um, one of the biggest here is zoning. So um, they can imply that donations are part of having a commercial operation or having uh, paid events. Um, you know, the other, the same consideration, I mean, it is an agritourism event, so just you do have to worry about uh, people coming to the farm and just the inherent risks. I mean, again, it's something where your liability, it's a more gray with donations, but just any way you can avoid any potential litigious situation is always good. So it's just something to think about in terms of, um, you know, what, uh, what your risks are and what's happening and then just having a clear understanding from the different people participating um, is who's responsible for what and talking about that ahead of time. Um, so I would say that's kind of the biggest considerations for those and again like with the donations it's just how it would be argued in court so would it be argued that it was basically required? Um, would it be argued that it's very general? Um, and if, again, if you have some alcohol available, if you're not really charging directly for the alcohol, you can get around some of those um, requirements. Um, again, it's a good idea to have someone serving that rather than people just taking it. And again, it's still a good idea to get insurance. Um, Tracy asks, can proper signage eliminate the need for ADA compliance to use a barn as a wedding venue um, and retain the originality of the barn? Um, Generally, I'm not exactly sure on a, all ADA requirements, um, but generally if it's a commercial venue, you're required to meet all the commercial building code requirements unless you fall under non-conforming use. That's actually something you would work out more directly with your um, local building officer um, to find out what the standards are for having to meet those or not having to meet those. Sometimes people use um, for like bathrooms, you can rent um, ba bathrooms that um, that have um, that, that are ADA compliant. It also depends on the wedding. So if it's, it's like a personal wedding that's not generally open to, like you're not renting it out to someone you don't know, you can sometimes get away with that. Um, but I would I would just note um, also about talking to your local building code officers to when when they require and if you fall under any previous exemptions um, because. Uh, it, you sometimes can if your building was prior to a date. So sometimes you can get around that. Um, so it's just important to understand where, um, what the requirements are from your local building code officer. I mean, you are required to meet building codes um, or at least the basics. And so if you're having wedding venues, again, that you allow outside people to rent out, you're not having like a wedding for your daughter or something like that, then um, you need to um, think about um, what 
what the considerations are and what you might be having, especially in terms of like uh, fire extinguishers and uh, smoke detectors and things like that. Um, so it's just important to understand where the different lines are from your local building code officer of when you have to have certain things or when you might fall under exemptions because it is a, a building that a pre-existing building. Um, does the length of event or the number of guests play into liability? So I saw that you're in New York, so I can't speak specifically to New York. Um, in Pennsylvania, and I would say pretty generally, no. If people are paying to come onto your property, the business invitee standard, no matter, you know, whatever it is in your state, applies. Um, so that's kind of um, the, the general thing. So that's that's what you need to understand is that as long as people are paying and they're considered a business invitee, um, then then it's, then you generally are going to have to meet those like you're generally going to have the same liability. It doesn't matter the length of the event. Um, and I'm trying to find the standard again for um, quid pro quo or in kind. I mean, <laughs> we're getting into some pretty uh, nuanced things and gray areas. Um, I would say if you are exchanging consideration for entering your property, then the business invitee standard applies. Um, so if it's still payment, it's just payment in a different form. Um, so that's the kind of thing that you have to um, be aware of um, because as long as there's an exchange of, of that, then, um, then, then you could be considered to be a paid or um, a business invitee because you're coming on there through the course of doing business. Um, so, the, so I looked up the standards. So for business invitees, like we talked about, um, you have to um, uh, routinely inspect for the premises for dangerous con conditions, warn invitees of known dangers, and fix any of those hazards. So that's, again, for business. License fee are people that come on for a purpose other than financial gain or experience. So this is generally applies to friends and family um, and neighbors dropping by or kind of people coming onto the property if um, and visitors the owner did not uh, that come onto the property. So basically you have a duty to warn them of known dangers that the owner is aware of. So in the business invitee, you have to, that's why I said having those standard operating procedures to check for dangers. So you actually have to go out and like look at your farm for dangers, whereas for licensees, you just have to warn them of any dangers you know of. Um, so some of the inherent dangers that come with farming or things like that, or like things like the inherent dangers that come with agritainment that's now going to be protected under potentially, again, potentially protected under the agritainment limited liability law and is protected under the Ohio one are kind of the inherent dangers and, and ones you might know about. Like, hey, I know such and such, there's a tree that fell over there. Be careful of that. Um, whereas with business invitees, you have to actually go look for the potential of fallen trees and hazards to make sure you warn people about them. Okay, do we have other questions that folks are sitting on that they would like to have addressed uh, here for the benefit of uh, the folks on the line? Did we still have 25 or 30 people on the line, so I would uh, I'd say there's probably a few questions out there yet. Um, I'll say generally, uh, I know Farm Commons has put out uh, a guide on agritourism. Like I said, I posted the ATRA one. That's good. And that one includes also a lot of business advice. I mean, again, you're basically starting another business. So it's important to, I mean, depending on what you're doing. If you're just having an occasional potluck with people in the community, I wouldn't say you're starting a whole other business. But if you are thinking about, okay, we're going to do an annual fall festival, we're going to have regular farm dinners, that's when it's something to really, um, really do some planning. And remember, it is another business. So just like when you started your farm business, doing the planning around what these might involve, talking to figure out if you should separate that liability, and just doing some planning on how you're going to market it. Um, that was a great talk that a lot of the farmers who do some agritainment activities gave at our workshop that we did in April was how important kind of if you are going to make this part of your 
practice that thinking about things like how are you going to market it, um, what levels of invitee are you going to start going for, um, you know, having things like an Instagram where you can post pictures pre your events or of pictures around the farm so people get enticed. So similar to how if you do direct sales, how you start to bring in customers, um, it's a good way to kind of um, think about how you're going to market that. And then again, just really planning for if you have 100 people show up to a festival or something like that, um, what you're going to do and how you're going to deal with that. Um, and reading all the contracts you get. So if you are renting things from a rental company for an event or um, renting porta johns or anything like that, it's good to um, make sure that you um, are aware of, of what their contracts are saying your liability is and making sure you're aware of anything your insurance company requires you to have or things that affect the amount of insurance you have to get. Again, I know things like who's serving the alcohol and who's providing it and et cetera are important considerations that do affect the amount of insurance you get. Uh, any any last questions? Okay, well, I'll, I'll give you one more one more opportunity here to, to send in questions while I uh, let everyone know or remind you that uh, you will be getting an email uh, with uh, the links that Marlene cited here in the Q&A, uh, as well as the presentation slides and a legal guide that we uh, distributed at our April workshop. Uh, on this topic. They're all great resources to get you started um, down this road. Um, there will also be a survey uh, about the work uh, the webinar. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, it's just a few questions uh, filling that out that really helps us with uh, future programming. We'd appreciate it. Um, if there are no more questions and it doesn't look like there is, uh, I'm going to stop the recording here and just want to thank Marlene for uh, taking the time and for uh, sharing some of her uh, knowledge and experience with everyone. Thanks, Dan. And again, if you guys have any other questions that pop into your mind or if you start planning events and have questions, feel free to shoot me an email. Again, my email is marlene, M-A-R-L-E-N-E, -E, at trellis, T-R-E-L-L-I-S, P-G-H.com. Thanks, guys.